This is part B for the flexibility and range of motion lecture. So um, we are starting, if you want to follow along in the book too, it's on page about 136, talking about um, goniometers and measurement equipment. So today we're talking about determining normal range of motion um, for a joint. So these are based on standards for each joint, which are determined by comparison with contralateral parts. Um, they're also based on demands of the individual sport and position. So some sports require more range of motion and some will require less. Of course, the, um, the hamstring flexibility, for example, of an O-lineman is going to be, for normal, would be different than the hamstring um, or hip flexibility for a gymnast. So um, you need to know what is considered normal range of motion um, for the joints. So you have a reference in your book on pages uh, 134 and 135. There's a big chart that lists all the joint range of motions. And um, there's several different authors of columns that have done research, but I'd like you to focus primarily on the one titled Kendall and McCreary. Uh, so it's the fourth column over. Those are the standards that we'll probably be using um, for most of the joints, range of motion. So highlight those and start becoming familiar with those, and we'll, um, we'll be working on that in lab when we meet again. So when we <clears throat> measure the range of um, motion for a joint, the most commonly used device is called the goniometer, which is pictured here. Um, there are some other instruments that you, that you might see. Um, one is a flexometer. Um, you probably have seen this a lot in some sit and reach testing. There's one called an electrogoniometer. It's um, set up by electrodes and then hook up to a computer. Um, there are um, flexion extension range of motion tests that you can do with a tape measure. Um, there's an instrument called a bubble inclinometer. Um, looks like that. Uh, that is used sometimes in cervical and spine uh, range of motion. Recently there's been some apps that have come out too. Um, the Photogoniometer Lite, uh, which is free and you can download that. Um, Dartfish Express has one. Uh, there's a couple more out there uh, that are actually pretty accurate um, as far as um, the app. You still have to know the landmarks though and how you line up um, different range of motions. So um, here's an example of using the tape measure. We use that for um, spine range of motion, um, flexion, and lateral flexion. So um, just some options to have. Um, <clears throat> as far as application, how do we use the goniometers? There's three points or places that we need to line up with the goniometer. Um, so the correct placement involves placement of the axis. Uh, which usually lines up with the axis of the joint. So we're going to move. There's a stationary arm, and that typically is um, parallel to a proximal bone of the joint. And the moving arm is typically parallel to the distal bone of the joint. And we'll practice doing this in lab of several different joints. Um, when we write down range of motion, we're going to, in this class, use what's called the 180-180 degree system. So the anatomical zero is typically the zero starting point for the joint, um, except for the forearm when we talk about pronation and supination. Um, that's different. But extension of the joint is recorded as zero. So if this, um, in this picture, if his leg was down on the table for the hip, that's zero degrees. And as the joint flexes, um, the progression moves towards 180. So in this picture, he'd have um, like 95 maybe degrees of hip hip flexion. So this is the most commonly used system and we'll practice using this in our lab as well. Um, for accuracy, <clears throat> we probably are only able um, to get within um, five degrees if you're pretty good at it. So, you know, you could say, well, this picture says maybe 95 degrees, but maybe you recorded that as 100 or 90 degrees, and that, that's pretty accurate. So within five degrees. Many factors can influence and the interpretation of the range of motion measurement. So if um, <clears throat> this person were sitting um, and went into hip flexion, that would change um, potentially the degrees. Um, so pos patient position is A. B is whether the motion is active or passive. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But active would be the patient moving his hip into flexion um, and what that measurement was compared to if the um, person taking the measurement there, if they moved his hip into 
hip flexion, of course, you'd probably get more. So whether the motion is active or passive, and usually passive is going to be greater than active, the number. C would be the presence of pain or muscle spasm. D would be voluntary resistance um, to movement. Some people just are not comfortable um, with having somebody move them through passive range of motion, maybe. And then E would be um, wounds. Of course, that could um, be painful or just scar tissue restriction. Um, also, in your book on page 140, um, you want to become familiar, if you aren't already, if you've gone through biomechanics, you'll be familiar with these terms. Um, but you want to make sure that you know these goniometric terms um, as far as the planes and what ab and adduction mean, inversion, eversion, all those different motions. Um, so make sure that you know what those are before you come into lab um, coming up here on our next session. Um, so let's move on then to stretching techniques. Um, when somebody is stretching, um, what are some application techniques that we need to remember? Um, as far as principles, stretching is used to increase range of motion and flexibility, all right, because both can be affected by um, decrease in muscle flexibility. So range of motion and flexibility. Um, the force should be low, so it should be a low force with a long duration. Okay, we don't want to trigger um, the muscle spindles and have a muscle um, contraction response, so we want low force and long duration. Application of he um, cold or heat um, prior to the stretch can cause a better stretch if the stretch is performed in the window of opportunity. So, um, for example, if we use hot pack or cold or um, ultrasound, um, after we take that modality off, we have about a five minute window um, where we can get the greatest advantages as far as stretching. So stretching right after the modality is removed. So what kind of stretches am I referring to or what we might do? Um, <clears throat> the first one we have is active stretch and this is um, where the patient performs the stretch. So starting in A and if the patient moves into position B, um, we actually consider that an active um, I guess it wouldn't really be a stretch necessarily, but it's active range of motion. And so you could on your outline cross out stretch and write in range of motion. So when the, when the athlete actually goes through that motion, um, that's active range of motion. Um, parameters are four to five reps, and they could hold that position for 15 to 30 seconds. Um, there's no overpressure, so not C. C is not part of it to be a truly active um, range of motion. It's just going from position A uh, to position B. So, um, If we want to increase this, um, the range of motion with an active um, range of motion, uh, we're able to capitalize on the reciprocal inhibition, or it's also called the antagonistic inhibition, um, by contracting muscles on the opposite side of the joint. So um, <clears throat> this is not a, a great picture to show that, but if you can imagine that you're stretching out um, your hamstrings, um, or maybe let's just go with quads because that's the example on your notes, but we want to stretch out your quads. If you contract your hamstrings and then relax, um, your quads will get um, a better stretch. So um, you can try that on your own, see if that works for you. Um, another kind of range of motion, again in your notes it says stretch, but you could cross out stretch and put range of motion is passive. And this is when the stretch um, is performed by the sports rehabilitation um, assistant or um, PT or AT or whatever, um, and, or some equipment. So in this picture, we have equipment, we have sandbags um, pushing the leg into a further stretch. Um, <clears throat> so if you had another person helping to stretch um, this into extension, then that would also be passive range of motion stretch, as long as the athlete isn't doing any muscle contraction. Um, the segment is stabilized and isolated, and then force applied and release is very slow. So, there are actually some devices that will do um, passive range of motion. Um, they're called CPM machines, and they're used immediately post-op for a lot of orthopedic conditions. One of the most common ones is anything done with the knee, so total knee replacement or ACL. Um, we'll often use a CPM machine just to get movement without muscle contraction um, and therefore decrease the effects of immobilization. Okay, moving on to splints. Um, splints are used um, typically with mature or restrictive scar tissue that needs greater than 20 minutes of stretch at a time. 
and there's in general two types of splints. Um, the first one is a dynamic splint and it's uh, it's a constantly changing as range of motion improves. Um, so it's, they're usually spring-loaded. They kind of look like this one on the top right. Um, they have a spring-loaded mechanism so that as the range of motion of distance for an elbow, as it increases, um, the splint just keeps moving with it. Versus this one down here, um, which is static, which is number two on your um, notes. A static splint is a three-point um, system that has to be adjusted. Um, so this isn't going to be an adjustable one. Um, it's static. It doesn't move with the range of motion as it improves. Um, this one will move, but you have to adjust it. So it's considered a static splint. Um, so it's got three points. It's got a, a proximal arm uh, um, and a distal arm, um, <clears throat> which then, of course, have to be adjusted. So. Application principles for your splints. The anatomical joint needs to line up with uh, the splint joint. The stabilization needs to be provided. So on these, it's the stabilization of the proximal sleeve. And then prolonged and early application is best. Okay. Another range of motion that you can do is called active assisted range of motion, A-A-R-O-M. And this is when the stretch is performed um, by the athlete, but also some sort of assistive device. So they're using muscular contraction to get into the stretch of the right arm for internal rotation. So they'll bring their arm back on their own, contracting the muscle, but then they also give it some overpressure um, using a little band or um, a dowel here um, to pull the arm into further internal rotation. So some muscle contraction by the patient um, and then some overpressure either by the patient with an assistive device or by someone else. And we call that A-A-R-O-M. Um, PNF stretching <clears throat> is a combination of active and passive stretching. We're going to learn these stretches in a completely different unit. Um, but the most effective methods of stretching in PNF, you can write these down and we'll, you'll learn more about them later. But the first one is called hold, relax. The next one is contract, relax. And then the third one is slow, reversal, hold, relax. These are all descriptive of the movements that will be done. And then the last one <clears throat> um, for your notes is um, a ballistic versus a dynamic stretch. And what are the differences here? Well, the dynamic stretch consists of a controlled um, leg or arm swing that takes you gently to the limits of your range of motion. But a ballistic stretch involves trying to force a body um, part beyond its range of motion. Okay, So we kind of get these bouncy, jerky moves for ballistic, but dynamic stretches, um, it's smooth um, and, and no bouncing. So the difference between a dynamic and a ballistic. So in the literature you'll see when they're talking about that they do not promote ballistic stretching, um, but dynamic stretching is a great pre-competition or pre-activity type of stretch. So. Um, as far as guidelines and stretching, um, indications is a decreased range of motion due to scar tissue, adhesions, or tar tight muscles. Uh, contraindications, recent fracture, if there's a bony block in the joint, um, an infection, an acute inflammation, sharp pain with motion, or when tightness contributes to joint stability. And an example of this would be, um, well, let's see if you have, um, well, somebody with um, advanced multiple sclerosis um, might have difficulty sitting up because they don't have um, the core control in order to sit up on their own. So um, they might actually intentionally let their hamstrings get tight. So with the, when they go into a sitting position and they have their knees flexed, um, they can lean forward and their hamstrings are so tight that they actually kind of hang their hips onto their hamstring tightness. So it's an unusual situation, but sometimes um, tightness can contribute to joint stability. So precautions: it should not be used, or um, should not be um, any residual that should be pain. <laughs> um, vigorous stretching of recently immobilized joints you have to be really careful of um, because it can hurt. <laughs> And then for a multi-jointed muscle, for example, of the fingers, those tendons go over several joints that we don't want to stretch um, all of the finger joints at one time. Um, you just do one joint at a time, and then you move on to the next joint. 
So when you're stretching over a multi-jointed muscle, you have to be kind of careful. The last page then is um, exercise progression and what kind of stretching do we use in different um, phases of healing. So the first week after an injury or surgery, we have <clears throat> usually three types. Um, the first one is active range of motion, um, can be performed frequently throughout the day. So if they can um, contract the muscle enough to get the joint to move. Number two is CPMs or continuous passive motion machines. Um, they're usually used immediately post-op. And number three is mild short-term passive range of motion. And those types of stretches can usually begin about day 7 to 21 um, after a surgery. It depends on what the surgeon says though. And um, <clears throat> Yeah, just because they're going to be able to give you an idea of how much collagen um, is in place that you can start adding some outside force. B, in the remodeling phase, we're going to use prim primarily, number one, prolonged stretches. And prolonged would be at least 30 seconds. Um, number two is short-term active and passive stretches or range of motion um, are going to be used to reinforce the effects of a prolonged stretch. So we want them, the athlete, when they, they gain a little range of motion from a prolonged stretch, to actually go through that motion on their own um, so they contract the muscle through the newly gained motion. And then C is when scar tissue is more than three or four months old, we're going to use number one is prolonged stretches. And now we're probably going to look at more of um, something like a dynamic splint that we talked about earlier. Um, because we need lots and lots of stretching for long periods of time. So I'll be ordering those probably through a company that comes in and fits those on a patient. And number two is, again, um, just like above, we reinforce it with frequent, frequent active movement through the motion that you've already gained. So we can't just wear the splint and, and be passive about everything. The athlete would have to actively contract their muscles. Um, so that the joint moves through the range of motion um, using mus their own muscular contraction. That concludes part B of flexibility, and the next session we'll have labs, so be sure that you are in comfortable clothes, shorts, t-shirts, so that we can practice doing goniometric measurements of different joints. Thanks.